So I'm going to start off by saying that uh, I still undisputedly have the coolest job in the world because no one else here is this chief science officer for a planet, I am certain. Um, but the book guy is awesome, and it's truly an honor to, to follow that, that type of work, so I appreciate that. Um, I want to talk to you about the following thing, which I'll lead off with. In 1957, the world of science and technology changed forever. And of course, in 1957, the event that spawned that was the successful launch of the satellite Sputnik by the Soviet Union. And that triggered at least two things, and those are the two things that I want to talk to you about today. Number one, it triggered an unprecedented investment and commitment into fundamental research, science and technology um, that the human race had, had never, never before pursued. And really what that's all about is that's about asking why and asking how. And until that point, those questions had never been pursued with the kind of resource that they're pursued now. And the second thing that that event triggered was it triggered a passionate pursuit of uncommon collaboration in order to deliver the what, the products. And of course, we sit here at this wonderful conference with all these modern technologies, and, and, and many of you realize, but just to state the obvious, that a lot of the stuff that we're benefiting from today came directly from those investments that were made. Now, point one is, is there are some fields that were passed by. Um, agricultural science, food science, and veterinary science, especially as it relates to, to companion animals, dogs, cats, fish, birds, um, horses. Uh, uh, food science, uh, those three areas were basically passed by in this unprecedented investment. And the point that I want to leave you with today, the, the big idea, if you will, at least what I believe, and I'd like to convince each of you to leave this room and, and, and talk about it to other people and figure out how to help, help correct this, is that if we made the kind of investments um, that commitment to fundamental science and technology and that passionate pursuit of uncommon collaboration in the areas of agriculture, food, veterinary sciences, I think that a lot of the problems that people talked about during the morning sessions could actually be addressed in a systematic and successful way that, that would make everyone in here feel a lot better. So to try and convince you of that, I'm gonna talk about four, briefly, four, four areas that I know a lot about, because I participated in it and, and we've done it, but the point of these four things is to, to be proud of, of, of something that, that I was able to participate in, but also, to demonstrate to you and also be humble in that as cool as these four things I'm gonna to talk to you about, as cool as they've been, they just, they haven't, they haven't had that kind of, of a critical mass of investment and critical mass of pursuit of uncommon collaboration to take them from interesting and cool to providing solutions at the scale of, of you know, for the problems that we're, we're talking about today. So in 2000, I shed literally scientific tears of joy because I saw, um, for the first time, I saw unambiguous proof that a specific well-defined food molecule, um, it's, it's a, a specific molecule called minus epicatechin, and it's part of a, a class of molecules called flavanols, um, naturally occurring substances in fruits and vegetables, and amazingly rich in raw cocoa. Um, I saw that that that, that, those, that, that that food ingredient could increase nitric oxide in the vasculature, and that vascular dysfunction could be um, reversed. So I saw that in 2000. In 2008, we were proud to publish in a journal called the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which is one of the top journals, medical journals in the world. Um, we published an article, it was about our 140th or 150th article in this field. Um, an article which, was the, which had the following conclusion. Flavanol-rich diets can reverse vascular dysfunction. That's a pretty, in diabetics, sorry, that was the, that was the punchline, in diabetics. That's pretty heady stuff. When we saw the numbers uh, from this morning about what diabetes, what vascular diseases cost this country as well as globally. In 2010, we published an article um, which stated the following in the conclusion, same journal, so good peer review, high impact factor stuff, very conservative, don't publish um, too many things that are, that are wrong. 
the conclusion was flavanol-rich diets um, can uh, address or can uh, help ameliorate vascular dysfunction in coronary artery disease patients um, and increase the mobilization of circulating angiogenesis cells. What are those? Those are cells that circulate, uh, that come out of the bone marrow and they're, related, they're, they're part of the stem cell family and those cells actually help um, remodel and maintain the health of the endothelial lining of our plumbing, of our blood vessels. If you don't have that inner lining in a healthy state, then bad things happen, whether it's kidney disease or cognitive dysfunction or any myriad of other health conditions that cost the country lots and lots of dollars and also, more importantly, cost people their quality of life their quality of death, however we want to put it from this morning's session, and ultimately cost them their lives. Um, and I got really excited about it because I thought back to the first time I talked to a giant in the field um, of cardiovascular medicine at the Harvard School of Public Health, a man named Norman Hollenberg. And I remember um, showing him our first data, which emerged after about um, six, seven years of, of basic research that we had quietly pursued with cells, not yet in people. And Dr. Hollenberg got very excited and said, I want to work with you guys on this. And I said, you know, Dr. Hollenberg, why in the world would you want to work with us, a candy company? And he looked across the table at me and he said, you know, I've invented antihypertensive drugs. I've helped bring ACE inhibitors on the market. I've done this. I've done that. But we haven't cracked one problem, and it's one word, compliance. And we heard that word this morning. And he said, whether it's uh, treatment or maybe even more importantly, prevention, we haven't cracked compliance. And you're sitting here with fundamental research data that says something that is highly sought after, very tasty, very economical, um, we could actually make some headway in this. And I thought that's the first time when I started to think, hmm, fundamental research in food, uncommon collaboration could be interesting. The next story I want to tell you um, goes into the pet care world. So about the same time, um, we, uh, we had, we had done, been doing some fundamental research. Um, I'm, I'm very privileged to work for a company that enables, um, enables true fundamental research in food. And while it's fun to work in that company, again, the field, the sector, as funded by the government and et cetera, it just, that isn't there. But, but I get to play in my little sandbox, and I appreciate that. So in, in our little sandbox, we had uh, developed some data. And what we saw was that certain dogs um, were especially susceptible to accumulating copper, an essential nutrient, accumulating copper to a level that became toxic and eventually killed them. I happen to own uh, uh, one of those dogs. It's a Labrador. My dog is a she, Lolly the Labrador. But Labradors um, are, are a breed of dog that, that we think might be especially susceptible to this. And we had, we had assembled a multidisciplinary group, so uncommon collaboration, to try and help us push this further. And as I was getting excited and thinking about dogs, love dogs and all this stuff, there was a voice from the back of the room and the voice was from a, 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 an expert in human nutrition and the voice said, you know, this is really important. It's great for dogs that you guys are sorting this out, but this is really important because there's things like Wilson's disease in humans and other issues in humans that this data could actually provide keys to unlock that lock. And so I thought, wow, this is getting interesting. Uncommon collaboration coming from fundamental research. Then in 2005, um, the dog genome, the canine genome was sequenced, actually not by us, but by, by a group at the Broad Institute and a whole bunch of other, other people. We, we knew them and, and we, we've worked with them and, and uh, have followed up in our areas of work with that work. But um, we met with that group, a fellow named Eric Lander, who many of you will know in this room. I said, Eric, why were you so interested in, in sequencing the canine genome? And he said, well, it's obvious. He said, because the human genome is really, really complicated. It's really, really important. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to solve a whole lot of problems for us. But we need stepping stones to get to those solutions. And the canine genome, because of the breed structure, in the canine world is going to help us find our way to solutions for cancer, which we've heard about some today, 
much, much quicker than if we ignore these other comparative species, especially the canine, and just focus on the human world. And so then, it's like, ah, man, these uncommon collaborations, they keep coming up and they keep, keep becoming very, very useful. And so as we talk about evidence-based medicine in that arena, I think the, uh, the opportunity for investment in veterinary science, e even, if it's, even if it's just with the objective of helping us solve our human health issues, the, the return on that investment would be enormous if, if, we, if we tackled that in a big way. One other pet care story before I move to my, my last vignette is that uh, in 2009, so last year, um, we developed a partnership with the National Institutes of Health, specifically the, the uh, Children's Health Division, and that partnership is based on a co-funding of an area called Human Animal, um, Companion Animal Bond Research. And the premise of the research is that it seems that for many decades, this bond of cats, dogs, other pets with people um, can seem to be very helpful and very healthful. Um, in fact, there's, there's people who believe that returning uh, soldiers, let's say from Iraq, for example, who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder can actually be helped out quite a bit by, uh, by having exposure to pets working with pets. Um, there's data suggesting that hypertension rates are lower when people own pets. There's uh, lots of data, though inconclusive still, is what we would say from a pure science perspective, that aging, um, the, the elderly, are, are actually suffer less stress and, and have a more successful aging, if you will, when they own pets. So, this really this spawned us to, to want to understand this better. Number one, we want to understand if the phenomenology is real. And number two, if it is real, imagine if the best thing we could be doing in understanding and solving hypertension would be to actually understand the fundamental mechanism of why stroking a dog or a cat actually reduces hypertension in some cases perhaps more than any medication could do. If we could understand those fundamental mechanisms, imagine what we could then do in, in healthcare research and the new, new solutions we could invent. Um, so then the last story I want to tell you about, and possibly the, for me, I have to say the, the most inspiring, is that for the last um, 10 years, we've been pursuing an uncommon set of collaborations to deal, with, uh, to deal with the following issue, and that is that we are a chocolate company, as, as Mark introduced us. We depend on cocoa. Cocoa is grown in the neotropics, uh, tropical regions of the world. A lot of these regions are very unstable. They're very, very fragile uh, from a social perspective, environmental perspective, political perspective. Um, and cocoa is itself an orphan crop. That means, in the world of, of medical uh, uh, folks like here, orphan drugs, means that it's an, it's an area that just isn't invested in. Solutions haven't been found. Nobody's putting any money into it. So what happens is, is these fragile systems, and you have six and a half million farmers depending on them, are extremely vulnerable. So we decided that we would start building some uncommon collaborations and partnerships to try and help stabilize this situation and eventually got to the point where we realized that we needed to inject some serious fundamental research base into this to have some stable foundation to stand upon. So for the last few years, um, we've been, uh, we've funded and have partnered with IBM, the Computational Biology Group, the United States Department of Agriculture, and a number of other universities, and we sorted out the COCO genome sequence. And um, on September 15th of this year, we released that sequence, and we did something novel and different. We uh, released it into the public domain and we surrounded it with a legal portal that guaranteed and ensured that none of that sequence data could ever be patented. Cocoa is a very valuable crop. Thank you. Thank you. Cocoa is a very valuable crop. It's one of the 10 largest traded commodities in the world. So this is a different approach, as, as you guys recognize. We did this because we know that to, to solve those problems in those regions of the world, and how does this relate to healthcare? Well, it relates to the fact that if you worry about healthcare in the United States, 
think about the healthcare system in West Africa, all right? And if you want to begin to solve health issues in a place like West Africa, you've got to have a stable economy. You've got to have a stable social system and environment. And agriculture can help provide that. And so we, we hope that, that this initiative will provide that basis. And we're, we're, gonna, we're proud to get there. We realize sequencing a genome is just getting to the starting line. So now the real game begins. And, and we, need, we need everyone's help in this room. And, and we'll put more and more effort in it to do that. So those are my four examples, and um, I'm out of time, but I, I do just want to, to state the key message that I came up here to deliver, um, and that is we really, I really personally um, would very much appreciate the help of everyone in this room with the concept of just think about what it would mean if we really understood food at a fundamental level, and we really understood agriculture at a fundamental level, and we really understood veterinary sciences at a fundamental level, and what that understanding could be translated to for, uh, for, for pursuing solutions in the human healthcare arena. And if you think about it and you like the idea, I'd love it if you'd go talk to other people, and I'd love it if you'd, if you'd come talk to us, because we could use some help in, uh, in pursuing solutions for those four areas that I mentioned we opened up. But, um, but that's the point. Please help us get more support for fundamental research and un pursuit of uncommon collaborations in food, agriculture, and veterinary sciences. I think it'll, it'll be a great return on investment of your efforts. So thank you very much. Thank you, Hill.